as I said before we had our short break, um, I originally thought that we would spend uh, an hour or so um, with Lubaina and I in conversation. But I've realised as the day has unfolded that there's, there's a conversation to be had really in the round with everybody rather than it just being about the two of us having a conversation. So what I'm going to try to do, and I should have some notes to do this, that would help, um, is to, to maybe recap on some of the questions that we've already um, touched on, to ask a few questions that I have of my, my, my own questions, but also to ask you, if as, we're, as the conversation unfolds and you, if there are things that come up that you want to you know, come in on, please just put your hands up and, and we'll have a, a more round conversation rather than sit and, and wait for us to, to finish and, and ask questions later. Is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> no, it isn't, but thank you anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so I do have Lubaina's wonderful new website up on screen here, and uh, it's quite new, isn't it? Yes. It's, it's so new that it's not quite finished yet. Well, I'm tweaking with it, but it's lubainahimi.uk. So it's simple, and, and the point about it is that the first website was a brilliant thing, a wonderful thing, that I loved very much, but I realized that people think of my work in in decades rather than necessarily knowing the names of things so and there are different sorts of hundreds of no dozens maybe different sorts of categorizations you could put it in whether are things are like projects or installations or series of paintings blah, blah, blah. and i couldn't work it out how to categorize it in any other way but in decades so it goes the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and the 2010s. So, but the search uh, thing, the search thing is quite good. So if you only do know the name of the show, but you don't know the decade or the date, then you can key in a show and it comes up. But the reason I'm being quiet about it is because, of course, it's, there's so much work which I hadn't sort of realized and and I realized that is completely mad but I it wasn't really until really really recently I kind of understood how much work I'd done it doesn't feel quite like that um that there are some things that I can't find the image or that the person making websites say well there's a show here listed where are the images for it and I say, oh, oh I don't know. <laughs> so, so it's out there, and occasionally we'll tweak with it. But it's 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 as done as it would be today, and probably by Christmas it'll be wonderful, wonderful. But it, it works. When Labena and I sat down and had a conversation about what this study day might be, one of the things that I I said to her, leading on from having read Jane's extended interview with Lubaina and being very much being informed by that was there was a moment in that piece that piece of homework that we sent sent you to read where Lubaina spoke about her work in the Tate collection and she says and I'm not going to be able to quote it proper beautifully but she does say that the work in the Tate collection was being contextualised as um, under a kind of label of feminist art, which is not a problem. However, where she was being contextualised might possibly, that, the work that might fit better into that particular um, juxtapositioning might be Maud Salter. And, that, and she says prophetically that when the Tate get round to collecting Maud, they will put Maud's work there and that she would rather be juxtapositioned between uh, James Tissot and um, Bridget Riley. Or was it Bridget Riley and Yinka Shanibara? And I just, yes, you did. Yes, you did. It's written down and you said that. So, and so, so, and I had been reading stuff about, you know, that you said. 
Because <laughs> it's written down, so you've said it. Um, <laughs> absolutely. I had been reading things, and there's there, and a lots of things resonated for me because there's 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 talk about um, the work in terms of remembrance of slavery, in terms of history, in terms of black people's contribution to um, to to the world. But there was something that really um, made me sit up when I read that very short part of that, that, that interview because I suddenly had this light bulb thing when I thought about how fantastic it would be actually to see Yinka Shonibari and Bridget Riley and Lubain Hamid in the same show. Um, and so I wanted to somehow within as part of today's conversations, go back to um, go back to the point at which uh, viewing art is uh, becomes a kind of uh, viewing beautiful things. You say, and you've, I've heard you say this before, that you know when you were in London you would go with your mother to see beautiful things. And mm -hmm. the beautiful things could be in a lovely, in Morley's. Is it Morley's? Does no. Morley's mean anything to you? No, that's no. Wolverhampton, sorry. <laughs> but you know, in a, in a wonderful, um, old fashioned uh, department. department store yeah. where there are lovely things. Yeah. But that could also be going to see lovely things in the museum and lovely things. Yeah. Um, but you, I have heard you on many occasions talk about or mention a particular relationship with Bridget Riley. Yeah. And I've never understood it, Lubaina. Okay. Um, so I'm declaring myself. When we did our um, close reading exercise earlier, if David had been here, he would have said to me, you didn't do that right because you're supposed to declare what your viewing position is. So my viewing position on Bridget Riley is I don't really understand what I'm looking at. I do quite like it. Mm. Yeah? Okay, yes. Okay. I quite like it. <clears throat> but I don't know what it is. Yeah? Okay. So, sorry, I'm talking too much. So I want to understand about you and Bridget. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there probably is a conversation between me, the person, and Bridget Riley, the person. I think anybody who knows both of us would say there isn't a, there is not a conversation there. But <sighs> the thing is that my conversation with Bridget Riley's work is that I can see myself in Bridget Riley's work. Um, I can see a desire to speak about incredibly powerful and important things in a, in a narrative way and really a real uh, in her a real understanding of how to get paint to do it. But the thing is that I wasn't ever taught to paint which is why the paintings look like they look. I didn't go to art school and, and was taught as a painter, I was taught as a theatre designer, so no one ever taught me about painting. Um, I, I learned whatever I know about painting from, from looking at paintings and asking myself, what is, what, what is this painting doing to me and what do I want my paintings to do? And I want my paintings to persuade people to act. And the thing about Bridget Riley's paintings is that they make you do something. Yes, it's a much more physical thing. They dare you to keep looking at them, or they draw you in or repel you, like I was saying the other day, the other minute. Um, or, but they're incredibly sensual, sensuous, sexy things. You know, they are absolute. Well, I think they're absolutely the epitome of lesbian painting. Right? And that's what I think. 
I think they are about women's relationships with women. I think they have a kind of uh, they have a kind of power that is uh, I don't know sort of mm. well it's quite difficult to explain half the room understands what I mean but it's a kind of <laughs> there's a kind of tension and and it's not about opposites it's not about similarities it's about overviews and close-ups it's about details and and it's about movement and that's why there isn't a conversation between me and her because if you read about her when she's talking about painting she talks about light falling on trees uh, that are wet um, leaves that are wet after rain how how leaves do this really and of course that's that's what she's trying to paint she's trying to paint water she's trying to paint nature landscape but but of course anyone who's trying to paint those sorts of things is painting something about i don't know it's, it's kind of she's painting some kind of desire seems to me so but the thing about them is that what, what most often gets said about them is that they are either cold and distant where people are cold and distant to them or they try to look at them and then especially the early ones is this kind of you know optical thing that happens and you have to back away but the very first one I think I ever saw was the one that Tate had called early morning uh, which I must have seen about 1969 something like that and they at that point the Tate was they did um, have galleries downstairs at the level that uh, sort of the the cafe is on mm -hmm. but it was a sort of we're talking a long time ago now we're talking well 1968 so we're talking many many moons ago but when they showed this painting and they would show paintings from for months and months and months and months and months and months it wasn't this kind of rehang that happens quite you know often ish um, there wasn't this demand for rehanging, I don't think, then. But they used to show this early morning with Giacometti's walking in front of it. And even at an early age, this irritated me beyond belief. I'm not a fan of Giacometti, and I couldn't bear the fact that you could imagine that you could have a, a most magnificent Bridget Riley there with this kind of hot centre that it's got, with Giacometti's walking in front of it. Um, and I'd which were on the floor and the, and the thing was, the Bridget Riley was hung low. Um, and, and it was a kind of, it was one of those moments really, because I understood that this painting was not a background, was not pattern. It wasn't to be juxtaposed with metal thin men walking in front of it. It was, it was itself. So I sort of think I understood a lot about painting there, that it, it was its, it was itself so that's what it is it's an early falling in love with a object but uh, that I never could fall out of love with it really and is that I've said in the blurb for today that that that's an ongoing conversation but is it is it uh, it comes in and out of Things. At the moment, it probably isn't a conversation. The work I'm working on at the moment are, I just finished another set of Kangas. This time the whole border is there and the whole field and the text is um, sort of underneath the image, um, which are going to be shown at Hospital Field, which is up in our Broth, which opens next Saturday. Um, I just finished nine of those and I'm working on some very large paintings, um, which are sort of plan B's with people in them. So, or C outside crashing against the windows and but people inside having some kind of decision whether to escape or relief that they've arrived. I don't know what shit is, but it's one of those things going on. So at the minute, no, there isn't a really a Bridget Riley conversation going on, but it comes in and out, it comes 
backwards and forwards. I'm probably having an Agnes Martin conversation now. <laughs> yes, sure. So that Bridget Riley intensity of looking, mm. is it to do with the structure of the colour that she uses and makes the forms, or is it just the emotional effect of what it is that she's done? Well, first it's the emotion, yeah, first it's the emotional effect of what she's done, and then it's a what is she doing? So it's first of all this, why am I being sucked into this thing, and then spat out of this thing? Why am I in tune with this thing and then out of tune with this thing and then what's she doing there what how is this thing made how you know the usual thing that that painters or filmmakers or printmakers or musicians do is then they think well how is this made then they stand back from it and we think well how, how is it how is it done well I don't, I, don't, I don't know i mean i can work out now but so you can actually work out how it's done okay there's, there's a thing goes yellow blue yellow blue 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 yellow blue yellow or whatever um but um but the how how do you know how do you, how does she know to try that experiment mm. is it's the tone of the blue or the yeah, that's right. I mean, it, and and the, yes, it, you can put the same blue, n the same blue next to a black or a yellow or a red, and the blue becomes a different blue. So there's that too. Is the what happens to the same thing when it's put next to a different thing? So is that part of your computing of how it's put together to get the effect? Yes. Okay. I think so. Yes. Yes, definitely. So you, the way you talk about Riley's work is mm. pulling you in and then spitting you out. Yes. It implies this movement of the viewer. They yeah. kind of suggest or even require that kind of movement, right? And something I've heard you say before about your work is whether it's the cutouts or the diptychs, that they somehow imply the, the possible movement of those paintings, that this is not the final answer, it's not the final composition. Mm. They could be re-articulated somehow. Yeah. I think we saw that earlier with the handleable paintings too, right? You can look at them different ways, you can exchange them, they prompt a kind of dialogue. And so I kind of, when you say like that kind of relationship with Riley, for me, it, it feels kind of clear somehow. It feels like it, it's about motion or the possibility of flux. And I wonder what, yeah, what does, what does movement mean to you in, in the gallery space? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I think it's key, you know, the, the fact that I'm, I wasn't trained as a painter, I was trained as a theatre designer, and the fact that even that, trained as a theatre designer, I hated every second of those three years of being trained as a theatre designer in Wimbledon Art School. I loathed it with a vengeance for hundreds of many, many layered reasons. But... But I, I loved the idea that you could make theatre outside the proscenium arch. And in 1974 or 1976, that was the moment that, that in Britain, we kind of threw off the idea that theatre had to take place in this enclosed, velvet-seated proscenium arch space, and that you could encounter theatre much like you, many Europeans encountered theatre, the Spanish, the French, the Germans, as a kind of chance encounter. So, uh, and an encounter in the street or in another venue altogether. And I was thinking that kind of theatre, and my tutors were thinking that kind of theatre, and so there was a constant battle, really, between the two. Um, but so the point about the way I show work is that I, I know, because it happens to me, that when I go to see something, it, I bring my history and my self and my thoughts, my books that I've read and my music that I listen to or whatever to that space so I'm bringing something to it and that's the relationship that's going on and that I know other people are bringing that to it's not the, the work is not passive the people are not passive and they're not the same and so I guess when work is in a space which is why I have liked to show in object museums is that the work then talks to 
other objects that are always in the museum. So I don't mean, yes, sometimes it shows, I show work in an art museum, but mostly it's been in object museums. Um, so the Lancaster dinner service was speaking to the big mahogany table, Caribbean mahogany table. Um, the jelly mold pavilions were speaking to um, object museums in Liverpool. It was the fact that it was Liverpool that these museums were placed. Um, and so, and the uh, inside the invisibles were in the uh, St. Jürgen's Leprosy Museum in a place where people were experimented on and the cure for leprosy was found. So I'm asking you to be in the space, in the space with the things and move. You're like, it's like being actors, I suppose. Um, on the stage, on the set, in the play, but not in the proscenium arch sort of way, but the way that you would be in that early um, sort of um, 1789. Oh, the hell were they? I am old, but I'm not that old. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, theatre company um, working in France in the uh, late. N no, I don't mean that early. I mean, uh, there's a fantastic play. Uh, called 1789, which I saw in Paris, where the, the thing took place in a kind of place like the Roundhouse, that sort of... Um, it doesn't see... No, it wasn't, as it wasn't as late as Cirque du Soleil, but I can't remember what the hell they're called. And you, you participated in the revolution with the actors oh. in this massive aircraft, uh, aircraft hangar-sized sort of space, and you, you were part of it. The puppet, the, the royalty were these massive puppets, and you were sometimes thrust with the, you know, the, the knitters, and sometimes you were thrust with those going to the guillotine, and sometimes you were part of royalty. So it's that, it's those kind of, uh, I'm trying to make kind of chance encounters with street theatre or theatrical things that you can be kind of, I suppose like being part of Carnival, but that's kind of too much of a cliche and not entirely true because I'm not, I'm not an expert on Carnival, but it's that, how you're kind of part of it, but not part of it. And lots so of the work... So why, why cutouts? That that's why cutouts, yes, and that's why a lot of the work looks as if you can move it because I want to give the impression that you could change it. It is possible to change this work, you have the power to change it or to think of it in a different way, upside down or the other way around or, or configured in a different place. So, um, I'm thinking still about inside the, the invisible mm -hmm. work and thinking um, about Rosemary Betterton's book, um, Intimate Distance, and particularly what you were saying about Project Riley and the way that work attracts and repels and that um, Rosemary Betterton's book talks about women artists and abstraction. And I just thought there were really some really very interesting connections, actually, between what she's talking about and what you're saying about Bridget Riley, but also what, what can be said about your own painting practice. Well, you know, particularly these ones, which are small, they are intimate. And the, other, the thing that I was going to ask is, um, did you paint them on the wall or, or were they horizontal when you painted them? I painted them full on the wall. Oh, you mean when I was actually painting, painting them? <laughs> <laughs> I think I must have painted them flat. Because for me, the thing that I've been trying to, the, the, the term I've been trying to get at while looking at them, and particularly when you talk about the table, is that it's topographical. Yeah. I yeah. can see it as a table if, I, if I'm looking above, yeah. rather than if I'm looking at it at the wall. At the yeah. wall, it's then, it, it, it flips. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And so, why am I asking that? Hmm. I uh, mean, yeah, yeah I, it is funny because I, I do, I think I do more or less paint those smaller pattern paintings flat because I'm thinking of them as pattern even though I absolutely, they are paintings as a, and they're not pattern. I mean, they're not, they're not pattern. No, they're not regular. Um, but I, but, but that's true. And, and, but the kangas, those kangas were definitely painted on the wall. Of 
course, those big paintings are all painted on the wall. Um, it, it's, yeah. It's the intimacy and the distance that... that was yeah, it's very it's true. All of, that's really interesting. Actually, all of the cotton.coms were painted flat. Um, <laughs> it's funny because a lot of those sort of hundred works, you know, a hundred of these in, uh, inside the invisibles and a hundred cotton dot coms painted at exactly at a moment of unspeakable crisis, but also I'm on, I, I, I realize I can't decide which it is, whether my eyes were going, you know, around about age 40 something, late 40s, whatever, or whether <laughs> painting those paintings wrecked my eyes. But um, it's quite difficult to see them. So I absolutely know it was a very intense thing. It was a bit like that sort of tapestry, needlework, knitting thing and setting myself a task that was incredibly difficult but incredibly intimate in order to make something enormous but to be able to move that installation because I, I brought 23 in a in a shopping bag today so I could cut and run with them it was at a time in my life when I needed to know I could halfway through a set of paintings leave with them or get them out of the house or whatever. So the, the, the installations are massive, but the paintings are small. Oh, sorry, I have another question, which is again to do with, with this idea of something being intimate and distant, mm -hmm. is to do with the title, Inside the Invisible. Mm -hmm. And of course it makes me think about the Catherine de Zager exhibition, Inside the Visible. Yes, yes, And absolutely. the question of a kind of feminine aesthetic. Yes. Not necessarily a female aesthetic, but a feminine, somehow a kind of in that space of the feminine, which kind of goes back to what you were saying about um, about Bridget Riley's paintings. It's actually, you talking about Bridget Riley's paintings unlocked all of this thing that's been in the back of my head okay. in the presence of the work. And that kind of it's, becomes the, the way to actually, oh, I get, oh, right, I can see where that can lead to this. Does that make sense? Am I me saying anything? And I just wondered, I remember, I remember you having something to say about Inside the Visible. Yes, because you see, Inside the Visible seems like I, w I needed to go one step further. Inside the Visible is invisible, but then one, one needs to go inside the invisible because it's the invisible that needed examining at the time. Is it it's a question of where, where to go, where to, where to search out the answer next, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yes, if we go, if we sc scroll back, um, the, the whole project, certainly, well, still, the whole project is trying to investigate that which is invisible, whether it was us, in the 1980s, or the kind, now I would say it's the kinds of s lives that we live. Yeah, then it was maybe a kind of bigger general historical thing and, and an everyday thing about how invisible we were on a very simple sort of level. We weren't on the television, we weren't in the newspaper, we couldn't see. Uh, pictures of us and now the life I'm living or have lived over the last 61 and 61 and three quarter years is not I don't see it anywhere so I was trying to sort of paint it paint how how the histories collide with the personal so that's why lots of these exhibitions are kind of odd things that look incredibly personal but are also to do with bigger histories so you'd have something like revenge which clearly is about two women's everyday encounters with how to make this thing work this strategy to change British art but also this living in under the same roof while roof while disagreeing about everything and also how the histories of who we are crash in and collide with that um, 
none of which is visible. Neither the histories nor the everyday life. Um, can I just come back to, it's a really particular question, so forgive me if, I'm, if it seems um, a bit too particular. But when we were looking at um, the earlier work, I did have a question about where, whether there was a relationship between the Mansa of Mali and the Kangas. Blimey. There's a lot of years between the two. But yes, I guess there must be, because the Kangas were in my life when I was painting the Mansa of Mali. I just didn't imagine that I could or would want to paint in that way. I mean, all that early stuff is very fast painting. Lisa Milroy talked about it much, much more articulately than I could, I realise. But there's fast painting and slow painting. Her fast painting and slow painting is different than mine, but those early works are very much fast, wet painting um, on big surfaces. Things like the Kangas are slow, dry painting on paper. Um, so compared, the Kangas are almost colouring in. The inside the invisible is probably halfway between the two. And is that, is that change in the way of making the work, what drives that? Is there, is there, I mean, is it too facile a question to ask if there is a particular driver? For those driving two for, dis for, 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 for where the work changes. So what I, I suppose what I've been trying to do in looking through you know, looking at the work over, over those four decades. Mm. When I first started thinking about what I might want to talk to you about, I thought, oh, I know what I'll do, is I'll talk about the cutouts, because they are a um, strategy that you, that you use early on, mm -hmm. and that you seem to kind of, you, it comes back, it kind yeah, of goes away. I try away. not to do it when it comes back. I try <laughs> not to do it when it comes back. And then you come back to it. Oh. And I thought, oh, well, we could have a conversation about that. Mm. But then in have, trying to look at the work over that period of time, I, you know, often when I look at an artist's work, I see where there's a sea change in the way that they work and they move on to blah. Yeah. And then there's another change and they move on to blah, blah. Uh, but when I'm looking at your work, I'm seeing kind of cycles and circles mm. and things going away and coming back again. Mm. And I, I'm just curious to know what that is. Well, in a, on a very trite level, mm. there is this thing that used to happen, and I think still does happen mm. to mm. black artists, mm. which is that galleries museums or whatever say we'd like you to have this show but we want it in a hurry they don't give you five years to think about and think about the work develop the ideas <sighs> gather together vast sums of money to do it so the early work is all about seizing the day taking the opportunity and so quick wet ones indeed quick, fast, wet paintings, yeah. wet on wet, yeah. you know. And that slower making is the result of making work every day for however many decades it is in a plodding sort of way. And if somebody's interested in this, then I'll show it. So it's much more, and all of it, juxtaposed and interwoven with teaching, you know, for the last 25 years anyway. Teaching comes into that as well. I mean, I'm going to work uh, out of a studio which has always been in the house. Um, so, because I'm trying to think, and somebody must be able to help me here, after uh, Inside the Invisible and 
cotton.com comes naming the money. So naming the money got made in that same house, 100 cutouts. There's a lot of fast wet painting in that. Um, and after naming the money, we're talking then 2005 and six, seven. What the hell was I doing then? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, generally was 2010. Uh, oh yes, and the swallow hard. Yes, the Lancaster dinner service then comes in 2007. So by 2007. 2008, 2009, there are probably bigger lead-in times for those shows, uh, smaller works that make up these bigger installations, and so it's a, way, it's a kind of way of life that sort of changed in all sorts of ways. There's a less of an urgency about about saying this stuff and there's less danger I think yeah uh, yes dinner service yeah distance no object yes yeah 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 so there's le yeah there's just less yeah life is slower less dangerous Lead-in times for shows are longer. Okay. Um, and you're painting from 5 a.m. till 8 a.m.? On and off. I mean, yeah, but not, but not, yeah, not straight through because I have to go and earn a living just in case it's being recorded and you clan. <laughs> looking at it. No, but I am. For the, from 1990 to something like 98, I, I was teaching... Uh, pre-degree students. So I was teaching foundation students, uh, 80 students every year, uh, different 80 every year. So that's very intense. It's, it's intense sort of teaching. It's not necessarily deep teaching, it's broad teaching. You know, it's from this is a pencil to, to you could do, you, you, you know, you could do anything. It's about encouraging and enabling and that sort of thing. And then from and, and, and lots of degrees teaching as well, but mostly that. And then from 1998 onwards, it's much more teaching MA and some degree teaching. So everything's then also then slows down. I suppose that early work is just far, everything about it is fast. Fast in fitting it in. But I'm not sure that's quite the answer. Sorry. You can edit that out. Um, I want to skip really far forward now mm -hmm. and come to what you're making now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I just made these n nine kangas for this project at Hospital Field. I visited a few times. It's a funny place, a funny sort of uh, art school type place, I suppose, a, a sort of um, uh, art centre place, uh, uh, a house uh, in which everything in it sort of made by craftsmen but early 20th century craftsmen to kind of mimic that kind of, I don't know, um, pretty rough light, I don't know what you call them, uh, you know, those those people, William Morrissey type people, you know, all that kind of beautiful things made, m made beautiful, crafts. arts and crafts, that's what I mean. Um, and, but it wasn't really ever about the place. For me, it was about the journey that I had to make from Preston to Arbroath and from Arbroath back to Preston, often in a day, which is an extraordinarily crazy thing to do. That's two four hour train journeys, which totally reflects how my life is at the moment, where I need to be at home more than I need to be um, uh, somewhere else. And so I'm, the, there are nine of those, and they're kangas that um, reflect some of the things I've found there. Books in the library on Madagascar, uh, paintings of exhausted maids, um, lots of parrots and carved into staircases, strawberries carved into marble. Um, 
and then the texts are all uh, texts stolen from Walter Benjamin. Because uh, I felt, you know, I felt all the time I was, you know, I am a bit of a collector of things or a non-thrower, a wearer of things more than a collector. And um, very interested in that sort of journey through a place, uh, postcards of a place, um, much of the writing I do is letters to um, to Susan or letters to Lucy or letters to Richard or letters to Caroline I mean, they're all sorts of series of those um, and somehow that strangely using Walter Benjamin text seemed to work um, so that's what I'm doing but I'm also painting at, at the same time I'm painting some other uh, kangas for a project with bookworks um, which I need to paint by December, but what I also need to paint by December are a series of four paintings, which are in old money, six foot by eight foot, um, which as I say are these plan B paintings with people in them. So we now have rooms with the sea pressed up against the window and a kind of a set of people who are, I think, in the midst of a play about escape and arrival. And, and do we know what, temporarily, where are we? Where are these people? Are they from now, from then, from the future, from well, all that, time? It's that same thing of a, of a historical story crashing into a in crashing into the everyday and i um was at a lecture about uh, a ship uh, called Le, Le, Le Rodeur, um which uh, in in french is the the stalker the ship was uh, a slave ship and was going from the west coast to uh, uh the um uh, French Caribbean and on the way all the enslaved people and practically all of the um, sailors went blind and so this ship uh, because it was the surgeon and, and one other I think managed to get this boat to the Caribbean and when they arrived there were indigenous people there who helped them by mixing you know various herbs and things helped them to be able to see again so they obviously had some kind of infection but in the meantime some people had completely lost their sight because there was too much dirt too much overcrowding too much all those slave ship things and so I wanted to make a painting that was about being haunted by that, being haunted by a blindness, which, you know, you know, for a painter has got to be the kind of worst thing that could ever happen to you, and put something about that, that terror, into a painting that obviously is being looked at by people who it would also be a terrifying experience without it actually being a terrifying experience to look at these paintings. So it's not a paint, they're not paintings with, um, you know, people, uh, uh, enslaved Africans stumbling around going, oh, I can't see, I can't see. They're people very beautifully dressed um, in a kind of state of bewilderment and the ghost of the rodeur who appears as a man sometimes and a woman sometimes, uh, but, you only know it's the Rodeur because of how they're dressed, moving through these theatrical mm, scenarios, really. So they're kind of scary paintings to paint, like the Plan B ones were, but with much, but much slower and much calmer, um, but still with that not knowing where the dangerous place is, whether it's in the room, is that the dangerous place, or out there in the sea. This is my final question, actually, on this, because I'm going to just let Sorry. a couple of other people ask a question. But um, 
Is that that last thing you said about the, where the scary place is? Is that? Do you know where the scary place is, or are you you finding the scary place, or not finding it, or is that about the viewers' relationship to the scary, well, scary place? Okay. Well, I I did a lot of work over many, 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 many years, and I gave one of those. I'm getting to the answer. I gave one of those talks. Somebody said to me, oh, will you give some, a talk to some pre-degree students uh, just to talk to them about your work? And by this time, I hadn't talked to pre-degree students for some years. So I had all this work up. And of course, um, I was talking about work that I had made when they weren't even born, which, of course, I didn't really, really think about until I started to speak, uh, which was now I know that now, but when I did it then, it was one of those terrible moments because I just hadn't engaged in that way, um, which is foolish. But, um, and I did all this talking about, you know, um, Plan B paintings, da 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 And you guys, don't ask, did anyone get any questions? And you hope that people are just going to ask you the questions like, oh, how long did it take to paint it? And how much does it cost? <laughs> and, you know, all those kind of questions. And he said to me, do you think these paintings are about not knowing the difference between safety and danger? <laughs> I'm like, good grief. Yes, I said, yes, that's what they are. But I hadn't understood this. I hadn't realised it. I hadn't thought it. I hadn't said it. And yeah, so that's the answer. It's about that I don't know the difference. I can't tell the difference. I can't work it out. Wow. I want to close there. Um, I'd like to thank Lubaina for being so generous with us today. Oh, and I'd like to thank you for all coming and joining in and taking the conversation into areas that we wouldn't have necessarily imagined that it was going to go into. And uh, I think we should all give each other a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. It was good fun. <laughs>